Bookman Show. I'm your host, James Renford Powell, and this is the show where you can find out about the what, who, where, when, why, and how you can get your book into print. And we like to talk to a wide variety of authors, some of which I've published through I Am Press, and some who've gone somewhere else and published their book. But nevertheless, we'll be talking to them about their book and, and uh, uh, how they uh, came to do it. And my guest today is George Breckman, and George Breckman is the author of Contact and Cosmology, Extraterrestrial Contact, and Man's Search for Meaning. Welcome to the show, George. Well, thank you, Jim. Pleasure to be here. What in the world got you off into the cosmology and extraterrestrial contact? Well, I think for one thing, my dad was an aerospace engineer, worked for NASA. Uh, my playmates growing up had names like Hermann and Dieter, <laughs> and uh, they were the sons of the Panamunde scientists who came over. So I heard all this buzz growing up about these bizarre projects. and. You know, sci-fi was pretty big when you were kids, mm. you know, living in the Rocket City. We were all into science. We all took a lot of science courses, did a lot of science as hobbies. I remember building a crystal radio when I was like eight, you know, started building that home computer when I was, it was a Heath kit thing. You had to order it through the mail. Was this, it was 13 or something. Was this like all that. in the Huntsville area? Yeah. yeah. So you had that, uh, the space. Yeah. So uh, I had this thing treated with all of that stuff yeah. and everybody we knew was into it. So there was all this, this scuttlebutt on the side. It wasn't mainstream science. Some people laughed at it like they do today. Mm. I would say people are much more open to it today, but there was always this fringe of rumor that we weren't alone mm. and that astronauts had seen stuff that they weren't allowed to report. Mm. Test pilots had seen stuff they weren't allowed to report. And I think I may have been 12 or 13 when my buddy Axel Hines dad, Leo, who had been a test pilot on the ME-262, the world's first jet fighter, when he was in the Luftwaffe, and he later was working uh, at Wien Neustadt in, uh, near Vienna, which was uh, a test ground, the Skoda Works where they had, uh, and at the Skoda Works in Prague, where they developed a lot of experimental craft that later flew, like the Hannibal like and the Real. He talked about, well, we had anti-gravity drives. And so I listened to all this stuff, and I went, wow, why don't I find this in the history books? And it was years later before I found out that this stuff was right on the money. Now you went in, what was your career? Did you go into <sighs> Were you I did a lot of different stuff, man. I, uh, you know, like everybody else did in, you know, graduating high school in 1965. First thing you did was go and work for Uncle Sam. Uh, got some college <laughs> and then worked for, there wasn't a whole lot of choice at the time, yeah. as you might remember. Yeah. That's right, you had a deferment yeah. throughout a town. Well, I was in Vietnam for but 66 we kinda, to We kind of if we were neighbors, you might say, for a yeah. while. I was, I was in the Southeast Asia Theater for three years, Latin America Theater for three years. So I, uh, I saw my share of action, if you will. Well, you didn't start writing right away, though. No, I just saw things, and I always thought about writing. I read the works of Lawrence Durrell when I could, uh, like the Alexandria Quartet. I was always fascinated with the literature and how it's a lens for life. And I always thought someday, if I ever know enough or have enough experience, it would be interesting to write. Well, we, we have today in the studio audience, which uh, normally have to sit outside and watch the uh, closed circuit television, but today we have four guests with us besides uh, George Bregman, and uh, they are Jennifer Ledbetter, Cheryl Yarbrough, Aletha Baptist, and Jerry Bunting. And they're, they're here, of course, to, to uh, enjoy this scintillating conversation between uh, George and myself, but they're also here to talk about some of the uh, material that uh, George has brought, they, uh, which he generally refers to as emitters. And so we'll be, we'll be talking about how he came by this and what its effect is, and uh, these guests will also be able to talk about um, their experience with, with the emitters, right? Now, is that emitters uh, sufficient? I think that's a good for term that? for it. All right. Yeah. Did, um, now, how did, uh, how did you get involved in this type of subject matter? I know, I know you raised with it, but you, you, you got into it much deeper here because this is not a book that you write from childhood memories. No, no, that just piqued my curiosity about all of it. <laughs> yeah. 
and then I, I had studied Buddhism when I was over there. You might remember the Theravada mm -hmm. temples uh, and all of that. I was very curious about different ways of looking at cosmology, different from what I was raised with as an Anglican, you know. Mm -hmm. I somehow didn't find that completely satisfying. I couldn't really get my head around guilt and death and, you know, capital punishment as the main theme of my theology. And so, the Vietnam experience on top of that. Well, I saw that the only people who were actually trying to put an end to the war, who really didn't have an axe to grind, they didn't care if it was capitalism, communism, they wanted peace and they wanted what was good for the masses, was the Buddhists. They weren't out for political power. The Catholics certainly were. They had been in very tight with the Diem regime and the Chua regime after that, as you recall. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they were kind of a privileged class there. The Bao Dai cult was kind of in the same position. Mm -hmm. uh, the Buddhists were the only ones who were genuinely, uh, I would say, acting like uh, we would think the New Testament bades us to act. The, the Buddhist priest that burned himself, Yeah. Uh, this occurred just prior to my getting there. When I, when I got to... Uh, Horrifying. Uh, that was a, quite an experience because I was in a jet. I wasn't an experienced traveler anyway at that point in my 20s. And uh, when we got up above Saigon, I thought that we'd been shot down or something. That jet dropped so fast, it was just whoosh, right? I didn't know that they they didn't come in at a long approach landing. Well, like you're pretty vulnerable when you're coming along they, slow. They, because they were the sniper, so that thing just dropped like that. And then looking at the city it was like a blue haze hanging over everything you know and all this all these small types of transportation the two-wheel carts and mobile lets and and all this stuff and then and there's two cycle engines and that blue haze hanging over it and uh, it was a, a bit of the shock to the system I'm sure it was and you it, came from where uh, here the yeah Memphis area? well from uh, uh, from Fried Hardeman University which is 90 miles uh, Nashville no uh, 20 miles south of Jackson, Tennessee. Oh, okay. I so it was a, uh, so it's a, uh, but it was fundamentalist to say the least. And um, uh, so it was uh, a shock to the system. Now, still, I wasn't being shot at. You were out in the field, were you not? I was very little time in the cities. I just kind of went through, way from point A to point B. My missions were always out there somewhere. Yeah. And, and uh, at, at what point did you start moving? Was it from that experience with Buddhists there that you started looking at cosmology a little differently? I started just evaluating what all of it meant. I read everything I get my hands on. Camus, Sartre, I read Kierkegaard and uh, the Danish and Sartre, Camus and the French and I was just very curious about existentialism, all of these modern currents of thought and uh, I explored a lot of different things. I didn't really commit to anything, I just explored it. I tried to experience it. and. Uh, at some point, I kept hearing all of these reports, again, coming back home about contact, about the possibilities of contact. It was kind of an underground hubbub that you heard. Now, this is contact with, with somebody ETs. besides humans. Somebody besides humans. Extraterrestrial, human. all right. And that not all of it was little gray guys with big black eyes who wanted to poke you and prod you and do bad mm -hmm. things to you. Uh, and I, I wanted to explore that. And I didn't realize that eventually these two subjects, context and cosmology, would actually fit together like that. Mm -hmm. Did, um, now your, your first experience, uh, I've heard you talk about before, uh, how old were you then? Well, I think my first experience was when Axel had just gotten a new convertible. I think it was a Mustang. Memory serves me. And uh, I was maybe 15, 16 at the time. He came by the house to pick me up. I'll show sure you my new car. He was like a year, two years older. And uh, we went riding out to an area, just, at the time it was suburbs, maybe a mile east of the downtown. Nice spring afternoon, uh, just about dusk. And there was this huge thing that looked like two artist's palettes, like two triangles with radius edges, counter-rotating, and it was hovering really silently and then moving very, very slowly, slower than the automobile. Uh, maybe did you have feet. memory of that when you went to Vietnam and at older? Did yeah, you already I did, have? I did yeah. have a memory of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was maybe two hundred feet above the ground, and uh, we just looked and said, "Wow, what is that?" And it had lighted windows, and it had different colors on it, not like our landing lights where you just have red mm -hmm. and white, you know, starboard and port and all that. We couldn't figure out what the heck it was. So, like two crazy, foolish boys. We thought, let's follow it. 
So we followed it up the side of Montesano Mountain, up the old uh, Bankhead Parkway, if you know Huntsville. So it wasn't was. moving very fast. No, it was, I, I think in retrospect, it wasn't, we weren't following it. It found, it felt our curiosity and wanted to hang with wherever we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. to and I'll tell you why. Uh, we got up there and at the time where there's condos now, there was an old logging road where the state would, uh, because it's a, a state park, a state wildlife preserve sort of thing, they had fire lookout towers. And so they had this old ruddy gravel road going out to the lookout towers. So we pulled off there on a bluff. We got out. Hey, come here, man, come here. I want to meet you. And didn't think anything of it. As far as I knew, we got back in the car, came back home. Well, I wasn't wearing a watch. Axel wasn't wearing a watch. I don't think it had one in the dash, although it was pretty fancy for a car at the time. And uh, we really didn't know what time it was. Didn't have cell phones in those days, as you know. Got back, and boy, was I in hot water. My ass was in a sling. Where have you been? You said you were going for a ride. You got homework. My parents were real sticklers. You don't do anything else until you do homework. I had a pretty good average, but it's like you have this work ethic and you will work a certain number of, you know, it's kind of drummed into you. And I'm glad in retrospect that they did all that. But And they were both Marine sergeants, okay? So that's the household I grew up in. They met in a Marine Corps day. Your father and that's your mother both fact. were Marine sergeants. Fact. They were both wow. Marine sergeants. Not DIs, but they were both Marine sergeants. Mm -hmm. He had started as a raider, but they moved into a technical division because he was. He had a couple of years of physics back when he was in college. Later went back to school and finished it after the war. And uh, she was uh, an aircraft technician. She ran a crew that checked it out. So they met at an NCO dance in Cherry Point, North Carolina. Long story short, but so that's how they ran the house. So I was facing the court martial. And you were the home. private. I was definitely the private. <laughs> I wasn't even a Marine yet. I was just a recruit, okay? And it's like, where have you been for the last four hours? What do you mean four hours? We just went for a ride. Where else did you go? Do I smell beer in your breath? I haven't had a thing to drink. Dad, honest, I haven't. Smoke? I haven't smoked anything. You know, smoking cigarettes, of course, is what they were talking about back then. Not what we were worried about today with our kids. But right. <laughs> right. So uh, I discovered, I was told that I had been gone for about three hours longer than I should have been. Mm. Didn't think anything of it. Describe the the encounter with the strange thing that we followed it and it was like yeah yeah you're making so you're hiding something you went over to somebody's house you don't want to tell us so you hang out with those girls that catholic girl again I said, no no and there was a big fear you don't hang out with baptist girls or catholic girls for the reasons that parents used to tell us you know anyway uh, so uh, that's how it was in those days so i couldn't explain that well the next day it's or maybe two days later in school all these people kind of looking and pointing and giggling my mom kind of had no street sense whatsoever. I mean, zero, no social sense. She had called the Huntsville Times and reported that we had seen this strange object and what it looked like. Well, the weird thing was, for about two weeks after that, all of these people called the house and said, you know, I've been an aerospace engineer for 35 years. That was nothing that we make. That was real. I saw it because so people, people lived right there. Hundreds of people, right. of people who saw it fly right over there. Or with Fagan Springs neighborhood. Now, this is a phenomenon that, you know. So that was like my first big, like, in your face, we're yeah. here. I like in Phoenix and other situations where whole cities have seen yeah. these things, and yet somehow or another it gets denied. It wasn't how do, disguising how does this, itself at yeah. all. And how does, uh, how does that happen? How, how can so many people see something like that and, and, be, and, and get away with hiding it? Well, I mean, look, we had the entire nuclear program at Oak Ridge in Tennessee throughout the entirety of World War II. I mean, tens of thousands of workers went to this site and nobody anywhere in the country knew the bomb was being developed. How did they manage that? Mm. It's amazing what you can hide from the public pretty much in plain view. Or mm. there's kind of a consensual agreement, we're not going to talk about that. Now you subsequently had contact with those, that even though you didn't remember this particular thing right away, uh, the the three, the missing three hours. I've still never found out about that. Oh. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to go get a good shrink and do that. I would love to find out what that was all about. What kind of bees these were? Do a do it. a regression or, yeah. or hypnotism? Whatever it takes to. Is it. that the only way uh, that I know of? Yeah. And when did the next? The next incident, I, I was uh, 
right about to graduate from high school, and I was out with some friends down near the Tennessee River, just hang out, just summer afternoon, and we went through there, and there was these guys in an old panel van who were there, and they were kind of disreputable characters, had tattoos, which at the time nobody had tattoos, unless they either worked in a circus or were an ex-convict, or you know, the usual sort of associations you had in those days. The polite people did not get tattoos, you know. Even my relatives who were very poor did not get tattoos. It just wasn't done. And so, you know, there was this culture shock with these guys, and they were talking really rough, and they were gambling on it. We were just there hanging around, uh, kind of halfway looking for artifacts. You could get a lot of Indian artifacts at the time. They came down there and lived at the edges of the river. And uh, they said, did you see the critters? The critters. What critters? You know, what are you talking about? You know, they were talking to one of my buddies. And I thought they meant, were there deer there or whatever? And they told us very factually that these little critters came out of this thing that landed there last night. And I wasn't quite clear of the nature of interaction with them. But they described this weird craft that was circular and it had three pods that landed. And uh, we kind of laughed at them. These little rednecks are crazy or they've been drinking too much vanilla extract, which they smelled like. Interbreeding. You know, you know, whatever it was, we didn't know. I just heard maybe they were drunks or whatever, you know. And they showed us these very deep indentations in this hard, rocky soil that you have down there. And so it was like something pretty heavy was rested there. And they were exactly spaced, you know, like a lateral triangle. In retrospect, I want to say they were maybe about 70 feet apart from point to point, you know. So in retrospect, I became aware of the fact that this really happened, and I wish I'd stayed around and talked to them, but you know, it was this culture shock. Do you have any idea of how many reports there are of similar incidences? It seems to me, through uh, uh, talking with uh, Eddie Middleton, who is the state director for MUFON, uh, that they're very substantial. Very large, just large numbers of people talk about this. Alabama's MUFON chapter, and whenever we go to, I've been going to the meetings for years. They always talk about what's happening in the state. Mm -hmm. And quite often it's like a dozen or more in a given month. Mm -hmm. It could be pretty active. You would think Tennessee is a pretty hot spot because uh, this particular state, MUFON branch, has been in the top two or three for uh, right? a number of years that I've, that I've, uh, that I've been uh, aware of Eddie and, been, and talking to him and, and going to these types of uh, meetings. So it's. Uh, is there some reason, is it the mountains, or is there some reason for, uh, you think, the, the interest, extraterrestrial well, yeah, interest? There are coming? several theories about that. One of them is that nuclear power plants attract them. Another is that military, secret military bases attract them. You've got, I guess, Arnold Air Force Station is the closest thing you've got to a base that's doing really cutting edge research over there near, uh, gosh, over in the eastern part of the state. I can't think of what little town it's near. Manchester, I think. Mm -hmm. And you've got, of course, the Naval Weapons Facility over here in Memphis. Uh, you might expect to see them in places like that. Uh, and there's been a lot in near, near Naval theory, bases or Air Force all bases, England, country. all over the yeah. world. Another theory is fault lines. Are they drawn to fault lines? Well, you've got the New Madrid fault running through here. Or maybe a significant portion of uh, Tennessee's population are actually, you know, we're all hybrids, aren't we? Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> the, They're just um, checking up on their grandkids. <laughs> the, um, the this experience occurred before you went to uh, right. Vietnam right. and before you began a an actual career. I yeah, would, uh, I didn't really think about that kind of thing a lot when I was over there. I mean, you're thinking about kind of like staying alive and writing your reports if you're doing the kind of work I was doing and gathering what you're supposed to gather and Were you in intelligence channeling, it or to the, channeling it to the right people. That's the kind of thing you're thinking about when you're, when you're over there. Um, you're not thinking about things that go bump in the night uh, in that sense, uh, unless they're enemy patrols. So that, that's what we were doing. And uh, when I got back here, I guess working as an engineer for several years, um, I, I, I came across weird edges of physics that made me think. Well, what if we did it a different way? What if something else were possible? What if there's other types of energy? We, we know about how we think of things and how we think things work in the physical world. What if there's more to it? Because even in regular engineering applications, like I was working with basic industry, you're into things sometimes which are a little hard to explain. And we kind of try to force a theory to fit them, but I'm not sure it always does. 
So I was always open to the fact that there may be other types of energy and other ways things work that we don't know about in our normal science. Well, there came a day, though, that, that uh, where there was a contact where a whole new cosmology, I guess, was yeah. introduced. Well, you actually, tell I, us about I, that? I started writing a book about it, just trying to gather incidents from people I knew and people I had met in various places. And uh, one day, I went to, a, at the time we called it the, uh, Paras the International Parapsychology Research Institute. It was founded by Dr. Joe Slate. I'd known Joe for, gosh, 35 plus years, and he's, he's a best-selling author with Llewellyn uh, Stables, or their Llewellyn Publishing. And I think he's done his 17th book now, translated into 29 languages. But uh, I was over there for one of our meetings, and we had this gal who, her daughter married a guy in Arizona, and, and they're not too far from Sedona. She's over there. Maria's the consummate new age, or she always goes to Sedona for the latest whatever. She was at a UFO conference. She met this very strange guy who's about 7'3", whitish hair, very strange character, totally. And the strangest part was he came onto her. And Maria's this grandmotherly <laughs> little lady who's like, you know, 5'3", or so. She's very, very pleasant. I love her. But uh, you wouldn't exactly see chemistry between this grandmotherly person and this guy who looks like he's about 25. And uh, on top of that, he, uh, one of his friends told her during the conference that she really had to meet him because he'd taken this friend for a ride in a spaceship out through the desert. So she was absolutely intrigued. And he offered uh, her, yeah, gave her all his contact information and all that. So she was telling the group about it. And just as a lark, I said, you know, Marie, I am working on a book about this stuff. I want to talk to this guy. She said, well, he may be a total flake. I said, okay, so maybe he's a flake. I would still like to talk to him and just well, let's see Flakes are happens. interesting, too. Yeah, and even <laughs> if he is, he might know people, you know, who are the real deal. Mm. Maybe he knows CT. Who's to say? Mm. So without any further thought, she, she wouldn't give it to anybody else in the group. She gave me his number. So I called the guy. He said, I've been expecting your call. He starts like, that. okay. He's watched too many movies. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out he really had been expecting my call. This was all a setup from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ended up asking me a very weird screening pro pro process. He says, yeah, we would like for you to come, but we've got to screen you first. Because I said, look, if you're sending spaceships out to give people rides, as long as it doesn't involve abduction, and I'm conscious when I go and willing, and there's no weird shit, <laughs> count me in, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if it involves objects being placed in any of my orifices or penetrating my skull or anything, this is not going any further. He said, yeah, yeah, we don't do that kind of stuff. It's okay. And by the way, what's the name of your group? What were the Plavadians? I said, okay, I, I buy it. I never heard Plavadians. of them Plavadians. Plavadians. Where are you from? Well, from the Pleiades. Okay. And I mean, his story was pretty fantastic. He tells me, he looks 25, and he says he's a 12-year-old clone of one of their adults. I don't know how this works. Anyway, so I thought, okay, so I'll play along. So this is all pretty strange to you. It's totally strange. But I thought, you know, when you're talking about a book about ufology and researching, sometimes you talk to really out there people wearing tinfoil hats who actually lead you to good information. Yeah. And you just have to filter it a little bit. And you have to figure out what the source of that information. You don't take them at their word. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Researching a story, like any other feature writing. You have to investigate, dig a bit as you go. So... Uh, I, s I mail him a photograph, and I said, what are you going to do with this photo? He said, We're, I'm going to put it up on my bulletin board in my trailer. He's in a trailer with his mom, okay? Don't ask. Mm -hmm. And in Sedona. And I'll know when I get back from work that uh, they've checked it out. The committee has checked it out and vetted you to see if you're okay to be here. Okay, fine. How will you know? Well, I'll measure the radiation level. This guy's an engineer. I talked to him. He genuinely is technically trained. He's the real deal. And as a side note, Marie, my friend, said that when she was there, they had a break in the middle of this long UFO symposium. You know, this is they went out for lunch. And these guys with suits came over and get Jay. He's wearing a Hawaiian shirt and cut off shorts and sandals. And they sit down at a big table and they all bring out their laptops and uh, notebooks and are talking to him and making notes. So she thinks maybe he's not such a flake. There's something going on with this guy. We don't know what it is. So I mail the photo. I get a call back a few days later saying, okay, you've been approved. Um, 
They'll come and get you. Okay. And uh, I wake up one morning uh, without a really clear memory. I'm wearing shoes, which I didn't remember going to bed wearing shoes. I normally do not, you know, as you might imagine. And uh, they have, uh, you know, grass on them, which again, normally is not the case. And they're a little bit muddy because it was March and it had rained not too far away, or maybe it was due, I don't know what it was, but anyway, a bit money. Come back in, and I didn't think anything about it. Uh, went to the gym with my son a couple of days later, or maybe it was that day, actually, and we bl I belonged to, to the UAH gym there, and uh, taking a shower after a hard workout and uh, doing martial arts for a couple hours, and he says, Dad, what are those marks on your back? I said, what marks? And I looked in the mirror, and sure enough, there were these two paisley-shaped marks. They were not big, maybe like that, about that wide, you know, maybe inch and a half long, uh, three quarters of an inch wide. Uh, one on the left side, just at the shoulder blade, the other on the lower right, maybe at the spine near the kidney. I, I have no idea. Maybe if some of the equipment, they had some equipment that wasn't very good shape. Maybe I got pinched or something. I just wrote it off as in a hurry, got dressed, got out of there. Later I found out, as the memory came back, that's where they put little devices when they were doing a download of information and they seriously put you in an altered state. Well, we're going to come back and I'm going to take a little bit of a break sure. and then we're going to come back in a few minutes and find out uh, more about what was revealed to our guest, George Bregman, and what he's done with it. And then we'll talk a little bit with our guest, other, our additional guest today, about their uh, um, impression. Of, of this, of these emit emitters. Okay. okay. I want to remind you that this show is brought to you by the Institute of Applied Metaphysics, the Church of Revelation, and I Am Press, uh, a company that specializes in working with first time authors, and by One Community, located on Walnut Grove Road. These are, these are the uh, ones who make it possible uh, for this series. Also, I want to remind you that we have a, a, a network with five radio shows. This is the RBR network, and you can access those by going to Blog Talk Radio, B L O G T A L K radio.com forward slash Renford. And you can see these shows that come to you four nights a week. There are five shows. On Monday night at 6 30, it's Pam Drennan with the Cosmic Contact Show an apropos name for our discussions today. And at 8 o'clock, it's the Searcher's Roadmap with Keith Blanchard, Countdown to 2012. And then on Tuesday, it's the I Am Well Show. And the I Am Well Show is dealing with alternate forms of energy. Our new host for this show is Heather Watson, who is...